Next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so and um, now the, the, the program, um, as you can see, as you must have noticed, we've divided this into three parts. After a couple of presentations, we, uh, we will have a five minute um, session for, for questions and answers. Uh, so we'll be starting immediately with the purpose of the workshop and a presentation uh, of the project concept for those that might not be familiar with it. And later we take two presentations of this platform and um, emergency communication models. We'll then have a five minutes um, question and answer um, session before moving into the presentation of the resist component. So we we'll look at the uh, piloted aircraft, the, the control ground station, the photogrammetric and cognitive computer vision, the sensors. We will have another five minutes break followed by a coffee break of, of 15 minutes. Uh, before we come back for the last hour of the of the session of the workshop, we will we'll look at the inspection mission model, the structural vulnerability assessment and risk management, the mobility continuity model, and then the cyber security assessment model. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, we plan to finish this around um, 1 p.m. So once again, welcome to this um, um, to this training workshop. Uh, we we will be very happy to have um, a very lively training workshop. So please, your contribution will be very much appreciated. Without further ado, I'd like to ask my colleague to and the project to give us the the purpose of this workshop. Thank you very much. Um, hello, uh, thank you for joining this uh, event. Uh, I'm Anastasia Garbi from European Dynamics and uh, I would like to introduce you to the purpose of this uh, meeting. Uh, during uh, this uh, resist uh, project, uh, we have developed a novel approach uh, for uh, assessing the, the, the conditions uh, of uh, infrastructures uh, with uh, very advanced technologies and a very novel uh, architecture. And uh, in this uh, session, uh, we would like to present a little bit in more detail the technical side of the project. So how, uh, what exactly was the objectives of the project, uh, how this uh, architecture was uh, developed and uh, what uh, actually, co which components actually constitute uh, this uh, architecture, how this uh, facilitates the monitoring, inspection and, uh, and assessment of the condition of the infrastructures, uh, what is the novelties that uh, we have proposed in this uh, project, and uh, maybe a few words about how this uh, have been uh, implemented in, in pilots uh, uh, with uh, some measurements that we did. Uh, we have um, I use these components in two cases. So this, all these uh, have been fine-tuned for these specific cases for a tunnel uh, monitoring and for bridges monitoring because these are posing special issues. And uh, here uh, in this presentation, we give you more details about all these uh, components, each one of the people, partners who developed it. I think I don't need to say more. Uh, I would like to invite uh, ICCS to present, uh, start with presenting uh, some core ideas of the project, and then we go on to the uh, details of the uh, pre of the presentations uh, with the training uh, session. Margarita, please. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, let me share my screen. Um, Okay, I think you can see my screen now. Is the key? Yes, now we can see. Okay. 
So um, I will not say more. Uh, I will not say much uh, in the beginning. Um, I want just to provide you an overview of Resist project before starting uh, uh, the training in its subcomponent. So I'm Margarita Costovasili, I'm project manager at the Institute of Communication and Computer Systems, uh, which is the coordinator of uh, Resist project. And uh, let me start with some information about Resist. Uh, it has been submitted under the topic uh, Resilience to Extreme uh, Natural Man-Made Events. Uh, it is a research and innovation action with a total duration of 46 months and the total budget of uh, up to 5 million euros. Um, as I told you, it's coordinated by ICCS and the consortium consists of 17 partners from nine countries, including two infrastructure users, uh, Techno staff in Italy and Ignatia, Odos, uh, Ignatia Motorway in Greece. Um, here you can see the distribution of partners all over the world. So we have partners from Italy, Spain, Belgium, Germany, Luxembourg, Austria, Switzerland, Israel and Greece. And uh, the overall concept is that uh, even though we have, uh, we have seen great achievements in the field of transportation, such so as uh, great and complex uh, assets such as uh, tunnels and bridges and so on, uh, they are still vulnerable uh, to extreme events that may uh, put human lives uh, in, danger, in danger. And uh, these events can be either uh, due to natural causes, for example, some uh, earthquakes or flooding and so on, or physical causes, mechanical uh, impact and failures but also due to man-made incidents and uh, cyber attacks. So um, the main uh, goal of uh, Resist project is uh, the first priority is to protect uh, people, protect uh, road users, protect uh, personnel uh, working uh, on the infrastructure and ensure the sim seamless mobility, uh, avoiding uh, any human and uh, financial cost. Um, the second uh, objective is to prevent uh, and predict such events and uh, increase the resilience uh, of the infrastructure uh, and also to react in such events, uh, minimizing their uh, impact and also restoring the services uh, as soon as possible. Um, so to achieve this, we have set a set of uh, innovations. Uh, so we have developed some uh, aerial uh, robots, some custom drones, let's say, that uh, are used for the inspection of the infrastructure and also for mounting sensors uh, on bridges and tunnels. Uh, some uh, ultrasonic sensors and computer vision system that have been embedded in these uh, aerial robots. Uh, we have um, a communication system that supports uh, secure and resilient communications among, among all systems and all stakeholders. Um, we have a cross-layer cybersecurity solution, uh, a mobility continuity module uh, for passengers and freight under extreme events, and uh, a risk and vulnerability assessment and management of such events. All these tools have been integrated under Resist platform that, is, uh, uh, that coordinates all systems and enables uh, the operator to have an overview of information coming from different systems and manage uh, the infrastructure. Um, so here's the architecture of uh, Resist. It is quite dense uh, slide, but I will just uh, present you the key points. In the upper right side, you have uh, the critical infrastructure, the assets, uh, and the data coming from sensors that are already fixed. Uh, on the upper left side, we have uh, the aerial uh, robots uh, that are used to mount uh, sensors on the infrastructure, but also get uh, data uh, from the onboard sensors and uh, images from the cameras. Uh, in the middle, we have the communication layer with the Redcom module. And in the lower part, we have uh, the application layer where, where it's a, a subcomponent, the, the application that will be presented later on, um, are positioned. And there we have uh, the monitoring of sensors coming from uh, the aerial robots and uh, the fixed sensors the vulnerability assessment module, the mobility continuity module, and so on. Um, so uh, as I told you, we have also a, a cybersecurity module that is a cross-layer uh, system um, that uh, enhances the, the awareness about any cyber threat uh, or attack. Um, Resist system has already been validated in uh, two pilot demonstration in real conditions and infrastructure. The first one was conducted in uh, North Greece uh, in Agnatia Motorway at the bridge TAF 9 TAF 11, while the second one was in uh, Italy at the staff premises and specifically at uh, A32 Miores Viaduct and uh, St. Petronilla Tunnel. 
uh, both pilots were uh, successful and uh, all subcomponents and resistance system was uh, tested in these condi conditions with very uh, good results. So I think I will not say more. I think we should continue with uh, the presentation of uh, the platform and the communication system just to have an idea how the whole system works and then we can continue with the subcomponents uh, presentations. Thank you, Margarita. I, I take the floor again, sorry to initiate, yes. sure. to present uh, the overview of the platform. Uh, together with uh, our colleague, uh, Dionelis Calistrato. So I let me share the screen. You can see? Yes. Okay, uh, I'll give you a sort of overview of the learning objectives uh, for this uh, session. So we want to present uh, the resist uh, platform and the uh, system uh, as a complete technical and economic and social uh, environmental framework. Uh, which helps uh, to take uh, reactive and predictive strategies uh, about infrastructure uh, conditions uh, during normal operation and uh, particularly in emergency situations. It, uh, this session also aims to present the overview of the resistance architecture uh, in a more technical sense uh, to show how this uh, has been developed and implemented actually uh, together with uh, all these components that uh, consist uh, this architecture. And finally, we will present uh, the integration environment that is an accessible platform from the web that has been provided to integrate all the components and allow their interoperation. At this point, maybe Dionelis, you want to take the floor? Dionelis? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Actually, the whole idea that uh, we had from the very, very beginning re regarding the resist framework, we have seen what the European Commission, European Union wanted. That was in fact, as we see now here in front of us, that uh, a system, a framework, a permanent matrix in order to see all this technical, economic, and social environment allowing every interested participant to be present and to reflect on what happens on each case-by-case -case occasion. The idea from the European Commission was that already in European regions and European states, they know that different areas deal with all these resist problems, not the resist as such, because the project did not exist, but all these critical infrastructure problems. And that matter was the concern of the European Union that we need to have something as a concrete framework, and that framework will be used by all. So what we did, and this is the resist framework that we see now, is that allows all the participants, which is the state, the region, the societies in the vicinity, the users, the operators, of course, and the insurance to digest what happens on a case by case. This is not that they care on the specific case as such, but they care to create a history, a framework, a permanent idea that every guy can see what happens throughout European structures. This is the idea of the matrix resist framework. First of all, it's a dynamic page, let's say, which allows everybody to reflect, react, and manage with the existing problem. The second 
creates all the key performance indicators to understand what was in fact the whole story, what really happened, how was the reaction, what were the permanent times that were needed in order to react, what was the cost at the end that we had to pay as society, as environment, and as real economics. This is the first part of the matrix that we will deal and we deal in fact in that resist. The second part is something that little by little on a case by case, we are going to create a permanent archive. So everybody will be able to visit what happens in that permanent timing, in that specific key, uh, performance uh, and how it reacted the special region what was the result and if it is something analogous to take all the proper information. The idea, and I close by that, is very simple, is the commission will have at the end of the project a permanent framework describing on a case by case what happened in Egnatia, once a critical infrastructure management was necessary, that will be also in the archive. So every other region could always visit and see in a dynamic way how the Egnatia, or in the Technositaf case of our tunnel in Torino, did happen two, three, four years ago. So they can see how the whole story develops. And more specific, and this is something that we believe should be underlined in our project results is that the insurance companies. The insurance companies are the most important element when we have to deal with critical infrastructure because we have the private, if we can call it so, operators and of course the state. They need to coordinate, to communicate and to see this is the necessary infrastructure arrangements we need to do. This is the risk for the insurance this is the total cost. We have to see at the end a permanent matrix in the long run. And I believe that we will gain a lot if our project at the end shows the need of a permanent matrix for the future orientations. This is something that I have discussed a lot of times in the past. I see now that uh, Vole is participating with us so we can easily manage and to say to everybody, this is the future. The training that we have today, as we see in our project, it will finish when the project ends. That is important that the project will finish and the training should not finish because the training should continue all the time based on the findings of our resist project. The training of today is obviously for the public. This is what we have asked to be done. So our elements are public. But later, when the whole idea will develop better, we can always train all the players on each case. So we can easily train them once per year, once every two years, how the different regions react because the technology develops. Something that today is modern, tomorrow will be already old fashioned. So we need to keep the training as such, not only till the end of our project, but in the long run. And we can see with the results of the project, what is the frequency of these training elements that we suggest. Thank you. Thank you, Liam Nellis. I go on to, to... Uh, present uh, how the, the this architecture that Margarita presented uh, have been actually implemented. So here uh, you can see the more detailed uh, view of this uh, architecture. So we have on the left uh, side uh, in this uh, orange uh, square, uh, what we call the data collection components. Uh, these include uh, some sensors uh, that are the lower part uh, fixed on the infrastructure, and they are uh, aimed, uh, aiming to continuously monitor the infrastructure and gather data uh, to be analyzed on a permanent basis. And then uh, we have the, uh, the drones uh, with uh, additional equipment that has been uh, developed uh, during the project. 
uh, that uh, they have uh, they, they go on uh, specific missions uh, either to just inspect uh, the infrastructure or uh, to to specific missions to gather uh, specific information about uh, areas of interest that have been identified uh, by previous analysis. So the the drone that uh, has been developed uh, is able to carry novel these novel sensors, stereoscopic camera system, ultrasonic and radiometric sensors, and these are uh, communicating the data. Uh, to the photogrammetric and cognitive computer vision system, which is analyzing the, the captured information and uh, in, the, in some cases reconstructs the, the 3D model of the infrastructure and uh, on it, it depicts uh, the, the problems, uh, problem areas that maybe need uh, further attention. This uh, is done by uh, like say a, a preliminary analysis that is taking place uh, with uh, what we call quick inspection. And then uh, there is a more detailed analysis that uh, engages more of the sensors. And there is this uh, uh, ground control station and total station that uh, are uh, on the field at the point of the exercise uh, of the mission, let's say, of the drone. And this uh, help to uh, navigate the drone to the specific areas and uh, communicate the data to the backend system. So the backend system and the data collection components communicate with the STCs platform, uh, which is uh, like a, a central bus, <laughs> put it this way, that uh, takes all the, the data from the captured from the field and uh, makes them available to the in the correct uh, type and format to the uh, processing components that are uh, available on the backend side. Uh, which are uh, the quick valid image validation system that um, allows to view quickly view the images captured from the field and uh, plan the next uh, session plan the next missions or actions, the photogrammetic visualization that analyzes in more detail the, the, the captured information, the structural uh, vulnerability assessment and risk assessment module that uh, takes all this information plus the information from the uh, fixed sensors and the existing uh, knowledge of the condition of the infrastructure to generate uh, the issues that have to be considered and maybe plan the actions. And then uh, we have the mobility continuity application that is a, a mobile application with a map and uh, some logic that allows to uh, inform uh, the, the users of the road, uh, the drivers uh, about specific uh, issues that appear in the infrastructure. And also uh, we have a, a system for gathering the user's behavior and analyzing uh, their actual condition and communicating this information in the best way possible for them. The cybersecurity module uh, is um, underground uh, back, uh, uh, horizontal let's say system for the whole uh, backend uh, platform that ensures uh, that the system is safe and secure and that is not uh, hacked and then we have uh, the integration environment which uh, gathers all this uh, information all this uh, information and uh, systems and components in an integrated way in a uniform environment and allows all the users to access a, a, whole, a single environment with single sign, go, sign on. There is another module that has been added, the process management uh, system uh, here on, on the side of the user interface that allows uh, to orchestrate the communication among all these uh, entities and the agents, uh, drones and humans on the control uh, floor in order to organize and plan uh, the, mission, uh, the missions necessary for inspection and monitoring in more accurate uh, way. I think I have presented in more detail these components uh, in, the, in the analysis of the infrastructure. Uh, I would like to stay a little bit uh, on the integration environment. Uh, this is uh, in a pre based on a pre-existing uh, module uh, 
a platform. This is called QLAC. It's an open source uh, platform. And this is uh, based on a web, modern web 2.0 uh, standards. Uh, it is a web uh, system that allows uh, to, to use uh, preset uh, tools and functionalities, and this uh, can be customized uh, for a specific uh, uh, application as necessary. It is uh, composed uh, of a web desktop environment, which simulates a desktop environment for, for users uh, that uh, can be configured to their uh, liking and allows this single sign-on. It offers data integration so that all the applications that are uh, integrated, they share the common data model. And uh, this is allows their interoperation. And then it is fully configurable to, to the uh, needs of the users. And this uh, the, the added value is that uh, every integration and development that can happen on the fly, this doesn't uh, require the system to stop uh, product, the production, the operation, let's say. Uh, this is a, a screenshot of the integration environment where we can see some of the applications open. So we see uh, the overview uh, of uh, the platform. We see the photogrammetric uh, composition of the 3D model of, uh, of the infrastructure, the mobility uh, application, uh, the content, uh, the viewer, let's say, of the, all the content that is provided. And on the bottom left, you can see the initiation of the process management system for which we will talk a little bit later uh, in today. So this is uh, how the integration environment uh, initiates. You will you see a single screen and uh, you have all the applications that have been integrated available for the users to, to use uh, the one that is necessary at its point in time. Yes, these are other screenshots uh, where they, you can see that uh, the user can uh, select uh, which applications are more active in, at its point in time and uh, work on them. So uh, offering a, a summary of this uh, overview, uh, each operator uh, uh, aims to, to increase the user's protection. Uh, to this said, uh, they must be able to uh, have a, an environment where they can assess uh, the, the situation of the infrastructure, assess the structural vulnerability based on the actual information that they have, the most actual, uh, combining this with the historical information and uh, the known condition of the infrastructure, and then be able to plan uh, the responses uh, and uh, further actions accordingly. So the, for this, uh, we have, uh, like uh, the, um, Nellis has introduced, uh, developed uh, some KPIs that are relevant to, to set for each of the infrastructure in order to ensure the increased re physical resilience, the restoration of the services uh, when, um, when the operations are over. This is achieved uh, again by the mobility continuity module. I didn't mention it maybe enough in detail, but uh, I think you will hear about it in the specific presentation. To secure the continuous communication under emergency operations, uh, this is a, a server application that uh, ensures that uh, at any point in time, there is a available infrastructure to support all these uh, agents to collaborate together. And for this, there is the following presentations, that uh, presentation that will detail this module. And then a safeguard uh, and effectively communicate uh, among all the entities necessary uh, with the cybersecurity uh, system. So that uh, was an overview of um, the, the design of uh, the resist platform and the uh, and, uh, architecture. And uh, I will stop here and uh, ask uh, Manolis uh, Michalo Dimitrakis to present us uh, this REDCOM component, the emergency uh, management uh, system. Hello, everyone. Let me just share my screen.
Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So uh, this is the session for the Rapid Emergency Deployment Mobile Communication Infrastructure, known as REDCOM. In this session, we will have a brief overview of REDCOM. We will discuss about the power subsystem. We will explain how the network deployment works on the REDCOM. And finally, some hardware specs of the computing resources. So what is REDCOM? REDCOM stands for Rapid Emergency Deployment Mobile Communication Infrastructure. The main objective is to build an infrastructure to support and handle communications in emergency situations when standard communications network are not available. For example, if we have an earthquake and we need to conduct inspections on a bridge, we need to have a communication infrastructure that can provide means for involved parties to communicate. This communication can be internet access, radio access, or cellular coverage. So what we did was to build a trailer that we can move around and put in this trailer equipment necessary for the communications. So first of all, how do we power the REDCOM? The REDCOM power supply is provided by an inverter. This inverter has four available options. First, of course, is the external power. Second is a petrol generator. Third is a wind turbine. And fourth are solar panels. The solar panels and the wind turbine charge two batteries that are connected with the inverter. The inverter, the batteries, and the generator are inside the Redcom trailer. The wind turbine and the solar panels are mounted externally on the trailer. Regarding the network deployment of the REDCOM, we have three options for internet access. We have an LTE modem, which uses SIM cards to provide internet through cellular data. We have satellite modem to provide internet through satellite. And also we have several access points that can be used as clients to receive internet access wirelessly from another wireless station. Of course, there is also the obvious option to plug in a cable. Additionally, on top of the REDCOM, we have an IP camera that we can use to view from a higher ground and also a GSM base station that can provide cellular coverage to mobile phones in the nearby area. The access points, the camera and the GSM base station are mounted in a mast that can reach nine meters height. This mast is retractable for easier transportation. Inside the REDCOM trailer, we have installed a server powerful enough to host all the resist platform. This server uses the Hyper-V as a hypervisor and all the resist components are installed in virtual machines in this server. Having all this inside the Redcom offers faster transfer speeds. Additionally, having all the virtual machines enables the use of a global intrusion detection system. The Redcom has two compartments. In the first compartment, we have the inverter, the generator, and the chargers from the wind turbine and the solar panel. In the second compartment, we have a rack. And inside the rack, we have the server, the monitor, the modems, the router, and the switch that are all connected with. So how the red fits with the rest of the resist components? As I have already mentioned, the server with all the virtual machines that run the rest of the components is inside the REDCOM trailer. The drone, the ground station, etc., are in direct communication with the server via REDCOM. This is how the REDCOM looks like. On the right picture, we can see the REDCOM actually deployed during the first pilot in Ignatia Odos. In this session, we discussed about the power subsystem. We explained how the network deployment works on the REDCOM, and finally, some hardware specs of the computing resources. Thank you. Thank you, Manolis. We have now 10 minutes, maybe let me check, maybe five minutes for questions. Is there any question on this uh, first uh, presentations?
Thank you, Anastas. Um, it, it's not really a question, but um, um, Palistratos, um, I think in line with his presentation um, in the chat said, it is important to focus on the need to train two teams. And um, well, the, the, the idea of training, obviously, is a, I think it's a very, very important one. And um, just as Carly Strasser said in his presentation, um, it will be very interesting to see how this um, training part of the project can outlive the project itself. You know, so it's um, it's something I think um, uh, the resist project should um, should look into. How do we continue such um, such activities even after after the end of the project? But maybe Carly Stratos, we want to highlight more on this. Yes. Uh, if, if, if you allow me, I see all of you there with, uh, I see that uh, you mentioned Vole, the whole idea of training. Actually, if we read uh, the project as such in uh, Deliverable 10.1, the whole idea is to train and inform the wider public, which is very important, the wider public. I understand that the idea behind that wider public is to keep them always trained and informed in whatever developments may appear in the sector that we are dealing with now. It is obvious that we should start, and I agree, the training of who participated in the project. But I presume that the different participants will always need to be trained further and further on the developments regarding the materials, regarding the components, regarding the findings. That is important. But the whole idea of the project is to train in the long run all the participants in the human life, which means every year. I don't know. I, I don't think it's for this session, the whole story. And I presume that we all respect here now we have to deal with training what happened in the different project uh, parameters. That is okay. But we must not forget to mention, not now perhaps, but in the long run to our conclusions in these developments in the point 10, in the task 10, that the training is not only among ourselves. The training should be permanent for the public for the industry, for the states, for the regions, in order always to be in alert and to see how to become better. Because today, if we train to all the excellent uh, information we received now about all the drones, the drones of today, one year from now, may be already passed. That was my concern. Thank you, Vole. Thank you, Kalistratos. Thank you for that. Um, th there is another question in the chat uh, from Carlos. Um, have there been tests of the system um, during real, even if mild earthquakes or other extreme events? Have there been tests of the system during real, even if mild earthquakes or other extreme events? Um, Margarita, would you like to, or someone else from? Yeah, sure. Um, actually, uh, the system currently, the system is not, uh, let's say, uh, permanently deployed in its infrastructure. Uh, obviously, the server is up and running. The fixed sensors are there and uh, they measure, uh, they collect data and so on. But uh, as you can imagine, the, the drones cannot be, we have not, uh, uh many drones we have uh two for each uh let's say um for each pilot demonstration um so we cannot have them available uh continuously to to, to make a, a full inspection process with resist system in case of such an event so there may be some uh, earthquakes that have been uh, let's say captured uh, by the fixed sensors and so on but the full system has, uh, could only be uh, implemented and tested uh, under the pilot demonstration. And fortunately or unfortunately, we did not have any earthquake during this, uh, demo these demonstrations. 
Thank you, Margarita. Thank you for that uh, the answer about the response. Um, I, I think we should proceed with, um, uh, unless there's any uh, immediate question, I think we should proceed with the uh, with the workshop. Anastasia, I hand over to you for. Okay. Yes, the next presentation is uh, about the drones and the ground control and total station. Uh, is uh, who is here from Fada? Uh, uh, good morning to all. Can you hear okay. me? Yes. Yes, you it's can okay. say. Okay. So I'm. Can you be the, the presentation? Yeah, it's fine. Yes, okay. Okay, so I am Jose Ignacio Murillo from Catec, and I will start with the resist components presentation, uh, uh, starting with the GCAs, total station, and the EPS operation. First component that I will describe is the ground control station, which consists of three different modules. The first one is the GCA's engineer, which is employed to define the mission, to create the flight plan, and to manage it. And it is used by the mission engineer. Secondly, uh, the GCA's pilot is used by the safety pilot to know the environment, obtaining the real-time image from the UAV first-person view camera as well as obstacle information obtained by the onboard LIDAR. And finally, the GCA's STC communication that is employed uh, to communicate the flight plan sending in to the STC server. Uh, so I'm going to describe the learning objectives of this presentation. There are two important people who must learn the procedure. Uh, first is the mission engineer that uh, must uh, know the objectives of the GCS engineer and the GCS STC communication. Uh, he must know how to generate and manage the mission and how to interact with the STC server. And these functionalities are covered and explained in slides uh, 7th to 11th and 14th to 15th. Secondly, in the GCS pilot, it's important to show the safety pilot how to understand the information available in the application. And this is covered in slides uh, 12 to, th to 13. In this picture, we can see the relationship between the ground control station and the other related components like the RPAs operation uh, that provides the sensor data to the GCAs and the total station that provides uh, the global positioning to the RPAs and to the GCAs. And so this leads me to the next point that are the these related components. Uh, the RPAs that makes the visual inspection through the onboard sensors uh, is supplying data to the ground control station, like the local positioning, mission planning, and the first person view video to the ground control station. And total station uh, is the component that creates the surrounding map used by the GCAs to generate the desired mission. And it also provides uh, the global positioning to the RPAs. Now I would like to look at the input and output data of the component. GCA's engineer receives sensor data from the RPAs and from the total station, and it returns the mission parameters. The GCA's pilot receives the first person view video and obstacle information for the RPAs. And the GCS STC communication receives the mission information from the GCS engineer and set, send it to the STC's platform. So let's now move to the description of the GCS, the ground control station for engineer. Uh, first, we have the surrounding map created with total station. Secondly, we have the waypoint list and the mission status. Third, we have the autopilot and local position information. Fourth, we have the mission control buttons like the start mission, stop mission, button for take pictures. And finally, we have the lab view user application 
which is used to represent the information obtained by the sensor of contact inspection drone. Okay, so I will explain the emission generation uh, while the video is playing. First, uh, the, the bridge point include is loaded and the desired area of expansion is selected. So the GCIS creates a list of waypoints automatically. We can see now the, the waypoint list that is used by the RPAs for navigation purpose. Um, it shows that we can select several kind of surface. Here we have the example of this. So I'm going to continue. Um, in this video, a complete mission is shown. And there are uh, some buttons to save the, this whole mission and load it later with the load weapons button. In this video, we can see a operation taking place. Uh, here, the sensor data can be checked. The waypoint list is updating while the drone is flying. The mission status and the the RPA is paused uh, in real time. So now I'm going to introduce the ground control station for pilot. Uh, this is the complete screen of GC's pilot. And um, first we have the autopilot information, like uh, the battery, magnetometer state, flight mode. Uh, second, we have the representation of obstacle information from the environment. Uh, for example, from distance, right distance, up and down distance. Uh, third, we have the stereo camera image. And uh, the bottom image is from the first person view camera on board of the RPAs. This video shows the ground control station pilot uh, during an operation. We can see speci especially the from distance from the bridge in this, in this operation. This video is from the pilot in Ignatia Odos. So let's now move to the description of the ground control station STC communication. Uh, first, we have the button to upload information to STC server. Second, the list uh, of server information loaded. Third, the buttons to select the ID. And fourth, the buttons for uh, uploading mission information to the STC server. And this is an example of the information loading in, in the STC server that is integrated in the, in the global control station engineer. Now I'm explaining the RPAs operation. The first RPAs is the visual inspection one, this here, which performs a completely autonomous flight through the bridge with the help of the sensor on board. And the second RPA is the contact inspection one, which performs several measurements with help of, with help of the onboard sensors. Uh, these sensors uh, that are used in the RPA's operation, first is the stereo camera system that is used in the visual inspection one. And the second is cracked with sensor, third, uh, the ultrasonic sensor, and fourth, the permanent sensor. These three sensors are used in the contact inspection drone. And now I would like to conclude with the most important points. Uh, so the mission engineer should have learned to manage the ground control station engineer and the ground control station STC communication module to be able to complete the mission successfully 
and updating for important data to the inspection to the STC server. And the safety pilot should have learned 25 L information from the from control station pilot, like the first person view video, obstacle information from LIDAR, and the RPA state. And well, that's it from me. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jose. We will uh, take other questions again uh, in uh, after two more presentations, so you can keep them for for later. So the next presentation is uh, about the photogrammetric and cognitive uh, vision system. Uh, is there Rafael? Yes, sure, sure, sure yeah. for interrupting. I think we also have the presentation from uh, University of Seville from Guillermo uh, regarding the second part of the aerial drone, aerial robots. Yes. And uh, I think Guillermo is here. So yes, yes. Okay, great. Okay. I managed uh, to, to connect. So uh, let me, I uh, will try to... Uh, let's see. So, can you see the presentation? Yes, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I uh, I am uh, Guillermo Heredia from the University of Seville. Um, I'm going to present uh, very briefly the um, the aerial robot or the ARPAST uh, uh, for tunnel inspection. So, so. Uh, uh, the the general structure of the of the robotic system of the um, uh, residual robotic system is similar to to what uh, has been presented before by Catex. So the idea is to have a, a visual inspection robot, so an aerial robot that carries the sensor that uh, uh, allow to, to to do the visual inspection. And then, uh, if uh, uh, after this visual inspection it is uh, detecting some uh, def defects uh, or cracks or something that uh, uh, the inspector need uh, more precise measurements, uh, the contact inspection robot will go there, um, uh, 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 just contact the surface of the tunnel in this case, and, uh, and will. Uh, um, taking the measurements using these ultrasonic sensors and also laser base or radiometric sensors uh, that, that, that we need. And we have also developed a, a reduced size uh, um, robot that you can see here in the photo for testing the navigation and localization robot, but uh, this is only, only for testing. Okay? So in the uh, Overall resist architecture, so this uh, clearly uh, 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 it is uh, within the uh, R past uh, block that uh, that you can see here hi highlighted. Okay. Um, about the visual inspection robot, uh, it is a, a similar structure to uh, the one that Catec uh, has presented before. It is a multi-rotor, a quad-rotor drum with uh, several adaptations. The main one is that the, it has a gimbal uh, with, um, with, uh, for, for camera orientation and stabilization that is uh, located on top, on top of the drum. So this is uh, well suited to, to inspect uh, uh, all the uh, profile of the of the tunnel of the of the tunnel walls. Uh, very important point: it is it, it is uh, autonomous. It has autonomous control. Uh, it, it is uh, it has to use the uh, specific uh, localization system for uh, for the aerial robots in, inside the tunnel. That is, uh, I will talk uh, a bit later. Okay. Yeah, you can see here some uh, a video for of, of the robot uh, in the. Uh, flying in the in, in the tunnel in Italy, that uh, in the um, in the pilot that uh, experiment that we did last month. Okay. About the contact inspection robot, so what uh, we have developed is a new concept that uh, so the idea is the uh, an aerial robot that uh, uh, make the inspection in two phases. The first one is that it will touch. The wall, so a stick 
to the walls in some point and then uh, uh, this card that you can see here uh, in the at, at the right uh, it is able to to move uh, into into the into axis uh, to it, it is able to sweep uh, all over the surface to uh, just to make uh, inspection, surface inspection, or to locate precisely the uh, the defect and, may, and make the the measurements uh, uh, precisely in this in, in this point. Okay. So it is able to mount uh, so the ultrasonic sensor for crowd width, uh, depth, also for jam modulus. Uh, uh, also, it, it is possible to mount uh, high resolution cameras and, and uh, rebar detection sensor. Okay. Uh, you can see here uh, one of the flights. Uh, at the right, uh, you have the image taken from a camera that is mounted on the on the cart. And the ideas in this case is a, a, a lateral wall that it will uh, just touch with uh, some of the. Uh, of the supports that that it, that it has, and then uh, what you can see here is that the, the camera is moving, is moving in, in the cart, just uh, sweeping, sweeping, sweeping the area. Uh, about the localization system and autonomous navigation, so the uh, uh, for uh, for uh, moving or for flying inside inside the tunnel. Um, uh, it is clear that uh, um, you need the special sensors because uh, because the usual sensor that uh, that are used uh, in in aerial robots that is uh, GPS or GNSS uh, in general uh, do not work uh, uh, inside the inside the tunnel and also the vision base or leader base uh, slant techniques that are also widely used. Uh, have problems because of the symmetry. So uh, a road tunnel or a, a rail tunnel has um, um, is uh, so the sections are very similar uh, along along the tunnel. Uh, so uh, these uh, methods need some, uh, some, some a lot of features or uh, yes, uh, irregularities just to to take as reference and uh, and, and make the measurements. So what uh, we have implemented is a, a localization system that. Uh, use a combination of ground-based sensors, in this case a total station that it's, it is also needed for, uh, for taking measurements, uh, but uh, it will uh, transmit the location of the robot to the robot and also board sensors, so mainly to the leaders uh, that, uh, that scan into perpendicular uh, planes. Um, and also an, an ultrasonic uh, range sense, range and range sense. Okay, and with this uh, we we are able to uh, to locate uh, the robot uh, in the transversal plane and also in the longitudinal uh, line of the of the tunnel. Okay, uh, well you can see here some some uh, video. Uh, let me show that here. Well, here in the right, you see, uh, you can see the the profile of the of the of the tunnel that is being that is being uh, detected, and uh, and here this blue line is the perpendicular line that is the the one that is uh, needs to be detected to to drive to drive the contact. Okay, and one uh, uh, it has uh, contacted it will uh, tilt uh, a bit just to maintain to apply a force to the surface. Um, so in this case, uh, uh, you can detect it because of the profile is uh, still. Um, just uh, some notes about the autonomous control. So, uh, in general, for the visual inspection robot, uh, uh, because it, it's easier because uh, it will uh, uh, go inside the tunnel, but for, for the cent uh, by the central part of the tunnel. But uh, whenever you want to uh, have uh, contact with the walls, the, there are some aerodynamic effects that is uh, coming for the airflow, uh, the airflow coming from the rotors that we interact and make uh, some uh, uh, yes, uh, recirculations and generate forces. And also whenever you uh, contact the, the surface, 
there also generate some contact forces that uh, we have to counteract using a contact or server or, or a force server. This has to be uh, embedded in the in the controller in the autopilot. Okay. Um, that's all. So the, you can see here in the photo the relative uh, size of, uh, of the drone. This first one is the smaller one that we use for for testing, and this is the largest one for contact and sweeping uh, in the surface. And in, in the right uh, right upper corner, you can see the, the, vis the visual inspection, okay? And that's all, so if you have questions. Thank you, Guillermo. We'll take questions after the next uh, two presentations. So okay. Maybe you can stay a little bit online. Okay. Uh, and now we go to Rafael. Or yep. Hello. Rafael. Yes. Okay. Let me just try to share my screen. Did this work? I, I hope so. Yes. You can see my screen. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Uh, so I, my name is Rafael Weilhatter from the Technical University in Graz, Austria, and I'll be giving a quick introduction to the photogrammetric visualization application. The main learning objective, objectives here are to be able to create a 3D model from the inspection data and to navigate set a 3D model. The application provides a viewer for the generated 3D data from the collected image data, and it is able to read all necessary files from the Aesthesis platform and provides an easy overview of the detected damages to the user. Additional functionalities include navigation, different rendering options, and taking measurements directly in the model. Here we can see the position of the photogrammetric visualization component in the resist architecture. And as we can take from this graphic, uh, the application gets all its needed information from the Aesthesis platform and does not need any additional input data. Talking about the input, this is an overview of the input and output data. And although we have different types of input data, the user does not need to care about this and can simply select an inspection ID. And based on this, all required data will then be accessed automatically. The output is, as mentioned before, a web-rendered and annotated 3D model of the observed structure. OK, so here we see a screenshot of the main UI of the component. In the first field, we can select the desired inspection ID. Fetch data will query the thesis platform and update the available inspection IDs. Whenever you select a new inspection ID, the data has to be processed via the process button to be, become available in the viewer. We then have two options to open the actual 3D viewer, viewer and the button, on the bottom, we have the optional delete local files button. All right, now here, this is an example of a process point cloud. In this case, the bridge visited in, in Greece. We can see the menu on the left-hand side. In the appearance section, which is on top, um, there is the, the control operator can adjust amount of 3D point scene, enable the iDOM lightning rendering option, select a different background for better contrast, and switch to high quality mode or increase individu individual point size. In the tools section, the user can take measurements, clip different parts of the 3D model, and change the navigation mode and viewpoint. Examples for these different modes include earth control, flight control, helicopter control, or orbit control. And for the completeness, we have also the scene section where the user can hide or display different scene objects like the taken measurements or the detected damages. Uh, by default, the viewer will load in the mobile friendly version with a lower quality. And this can be adjusted by the users by switching to high quality mode and render more points. But via this low uh, mobile friendly version, you can also view the model on your tablet or smartphone or whatever. All right. So to sum up the photogrammetric visualization application, in the, yeah, the user can easily create a 3D model by simply selecting the desired inspection ID. The 3D viewer provides many features to navigate the 3D model and take course measurements directly on the model. And we think due to its straightforward design, the application should be easy to use. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rafael. Shall we move on to the presentation about the computer vision system by Rames? Uh, yes. So should I share my screen from my side or? Yes, it is better. Okay. 
Can you see it now? Yes, it's working. Okay. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about the computer vision system and the uh, specifics of how to use it. Uh, so the learning objective essentially is to uh, illustrate how the analysis of the data that is produced by the photogrammetric system, uh, along with the serial images are then processed and uh, then you can get the results of the inspection. And then how you could, um, a user could actually visualize and re-annotate and edit the results uh, if needed, and also experiment with our different tools. And then the last one essentially is uh, uploading the results back to the ASTSIS platform. So the focus of our computer vision system is to really inspect the, um, the images that are being taken along with the 3D data and to be able to extract the defects and uh, annotate them, uh, the images with metadata. The components and all the subcomponents are run, run by the field operators uh, on local hardware. So the place where the computer vision system uh, fits in here is, uh, you can see here, this is actually after the uh, RPAS missions, then the data comes into the photogrammetric system where there is a 3D reconstruction that happens. And after that, the results of the 3D construction along with the images are passed on to the computer vision system, which are then uh, producing the results for uh, uploading to the STSS platform. So this shows you that uh, workflow in a more detailed way. Uh, and what I want to emphasize here is that our system essentially is kind of think of it as a toolbox that allows flexible way of composition of uh, the kinds of procedures that you want to use based on the context of the particular site, uh, because often the different sites have different characteristics and therefore you need actually flexibility in the computer vision processing. And so what you see here is that uh, the data that's being constructed from the stereo uh, has been analyzed by um, user input with essentially specific options being presented and the user can also edit the results and then pass it on to the um, next stages. And uh, we have actually multiple stages and with some options that uh, allows you to deal with complexity of the input data. So we think of the user in workflow uh, as actually three types of users. There is a basic user level who's kind of uh, just knows uh, which can use mainly the automated part of the system where you process the data with default pipeline with thresholds. Then you could also have an advanced user who essentially understands a bit more about the modules and how context sensitive input can be provided so that you can actually then leverage the appropriate module. And then the last one is actually a flexibility at the development level to be able to customize the workflow. So we are not going to discuss the developer level, but the basic advanced level is typically available to the end user. Now, uh, the, as I explained in the uh, diagram, the basic user workflow starts from the CO data, which includes the images, uh, disparity maps, and so on. Uh, and then there's a Python script that actually is uh, passed on uh, to get the uh, annotated data. So essentially, it's just a plain uh, tool that runs the input data through and then with the default parameters and gets the results. And the output of this essentially is an XML file that can be looked at. And so here is exactly the um, screenshot of that um, uh, result uh, where you essentially are able to run the tool with the appropriate different options. You can see the different options uh, basically which are allow you to specify the, where the source of the, uh, the root path is, the source and so on, and the sensitivity thresholds and so on. And then what happens in that is that you can, and in fact, you can select also which modules you can use. And as a result, then you can get multiple results. Uh, there are multiple parallel modules which uh, run uh, complementary analyses that uh, give you different hypotheses. And these hypotheses are then combined together to form the final answer, which then translates is translated to actually the XML files. And you can do uh, additional uh, processing in our system, uh, which is aimed at um, understanding uh, things like spallation, uh, exposed bars and corrosion stains and so on. And uh, this is a deep learning module that's available and that's called a multi-target inspection module, 
and you just need to call the tool with this dash dash include multi-target argument, and then you can actually do the processing for you. <clears throat> then the um, there's an annotation tool on top of it, so you can after the processing step in one step one, we can annotate the results by using a GUI, and you can reassess uh, if there is a need for some fine tuning. So the main input again here is the stereo pairs, the masks um, from the previous stage, and then the hypothesis results. And then the output is really the modified result that the user can provide. And then you can get a new XML file. So here is the illustration of how the GUI looks like. So you see the left-hand side, the images, and then the selection of these different uh, image results. And then you can see actually the picture loaded showing the result and now you can decide oh you know maybe there's something here which you don't really think is like for example this one is not a valid defect you can erase it and <clears throat> that's basically the sense of uh, the editing part of it and then um, there is this uh, we talked about this developer uh, framework which you can use so we underneath the whole thing we actually have it in a modular form the whole computer architecture and how it is composable and flexibly composable for different contexts. And so what we can do is we can actually, we also have these um, Jupyter notebooks that allows you to effectively analyze the special data sets that you want to further deepen the analysis. And that depends on the complexity of the background. So we have this uh, module called the deep prior module that allows you to allow the neural network uh, to learn the background texture and then compare it against the current picture um, and, and then be able to highlight some uh, and actually suppress some data which looks like potentially defects, but they're not. So this is actually a more advanced module which is aimed at actually supporting the workflow to reduce false positives. Finally, the results that uh, we produce are then uploaded in an SDSS platform and uh, just as um, um, Rafael already talked about the results from the 3D point clouds, as well as the images are uploaded into his tool. And uh, this is exactly the interface for that, uh, where you actually log into this, this platform, and then you effectively upload the appropriate images. And uh, that's it. And uh, you can also uh, write, type the same thing with the command line. Uh, so you, have, you can see that we have both a command line interface as well as sort of a um, GUI type interface that allows you to flexibly use the, uh, the modules. So in a sense, what I've shown you essentially is that we have a toolbox approach to vision and which allows you to flexibly compose different uh, modules together, select which parts to apply. And then we have both an uh, interactive sort of command line editing and command line uh, processing, or you could also have essentially these interactive tools for editing and um, display. So overall, uh, we also have uh, additional tools, which more from a developer point of view is useful. That has to do with retraining of the machine learning libraries and for simulation aspect of it. Uh, this is not discussed in this presentation because it's not the user, this is more a developer that does that. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. Uh, we go not now to the presentation about the sensors uh, for structural monitoring from um, CNR. And we have here Luca Belsito. Thank you. Hi, I'm Luca Belsito, National Research Council of Italy. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So um, I'm going to describe three different modules. Um, one that we have developed for uh, structural monitoring and measured depth of crack, one for the width, and finally the permanent sensors, the vibration module itself. 
Um, for, uh, I will start with the crack depth measurement system. This is uh, the outline, the introduction of this module. After a short introduction about the type of measurement, I will show the prototype, the integration uh, on the inspector, and uh, we will see in detail uh, the input uh, and output of the module, uh, how the measurement can be set in the user application. So just a second. So um, for um, the ultrasonic measurement, we use two piezoelectric transducers, one for the emission and one for detection. And we measure the, the time between the emission and detection. And uh, this kind of measurement, if uh, once uh, we know the distance between the transducers, allow us uh, to determine uh, the ultrasonic speed. Uh, with this kind of measurement, we can also to determine the depth. Um, basically, when uh, the ultrasonic wave is generated from the transducers uh, on the left here, and the ultrasonic wave uh, propagates across the concrete, is then reflected from the bottom of the crack, and then it's detected by the receiver. By measuring the time between the emission and detection, and by exploiting the Pythagorean theorem, we can determine the depth if the ultrasonic speed has been measured in a position close to the crack as well. This is a really simple idea. Um, we started looking in the, in the market if there was the possibility to find something for taking this kind of measurement, but uh, nothing was uh, useful for the measurement because for the depth, it's really important to have really high attuation voltage. And we also to have something really small with the USB communication to be remotely controlled and is integrated on the drone. So we decided to realize this custom uh, pass a receiver unit uh, where the user has the possibility to set the attuation voltage from 300 to 30 kilovolt. The system is small, the package is 12 centimeter for 5 square uh, centimeter. And there is also the possibility to set the attuation frequency. So this pass receiver unit can be used with several transducers. On the right, we can see this uh, in orange color are two uh, commercial transducers uh, from, with a resonance frequency of 54 kilohertz that we use for the measurement. Uh, here we can see an example of acoustic wave detected by using this uh, uh, unit uh, with an attuation voltage of 2 kilo. Um, these are the main specification of the module that we have designed. Um, there are the possibility to set with the 200 levels uh, the attuation voltage from 300 to kilohertz. The frequency can be set from 10 kilohertz to 10 megahertz. Um, there is also the pulse repetition frequency up to 10 hertz. They also in the receiver part, there are two channels where we can decide the, the gain of the receiver. And also, there is the system is equipped with a really high resolution of time to digital conversion. Uh, the communication is by USB. Uh, this module is integrated on the, the factor and they communicate directly with the ground control station by using a USB. Um, for uh, the input for the system, um, the, by using a user application, the final user can set all the measurement parameter, like I was saying before, the driving voltage, the resonance frequency, um, depending on the piezo that you are using, um, the gain of the receiver, uh, the algorithm also for determine the, the time of flight, so a zero cross or threshold algorithm, and uh, the output of the measurement are the acoustic wave detected, the ultrasonic time of flight, so the ultrasonic speed, the young modules, and finally, obviously, the crack depth. Here we can see the user application. We have developed this user application in the LabVIEW environment. On the, in the, on the top of the user application, here in the pulse measurement configuration, the user set all this measurement parameter that I have described. In this point are the frequency of the transducers, the high voltage uh, attuation, this kind is 2000, 
the gain of the receiver, the channel for the receiver, set also the distance between the transducers, uh, the algorithm used to determine the time of flight. Here we can see an example of the acoustic wave detected by using the app. Um, we have two uh, main controllers here on the left for the surface velocity and on the right for the depth. There is also to the possibility to measure the real actuation voltage here on the in this point. We can now move to another system that we have developed for the width measurement. Uh, we started fabricating uh, optoacoustic MAM sensors for this kind of measurement, but uh, we had some problem with the reliability of the sensor, so we designed to move to a second source solution based on an indirect optical phase measurement. This kind of measurement is an alternative to the optic, uh, to the vision measurement realized from the, by the colleague. And we will see in this module the, the principle of the measurement, the fabrication of the first prototype, the integration in the RACIST platform, and the user application with the input and output of the module. And in this, uh, the principle of this kind of measurement is an in indirect uh, optical phase measurement. Uh, basically, it's as in the LIDAR system, uh, we use a modulated laser source, which is used to interrogate uh, a target. And uh, we measure the optical power reflected from the target by using an avalanche photodiode. By measuring the difference in phase uh, between the emission and the detection, we can uh, determine the distance of the target because the distance is related to the phase difference and the wavelengths used to modulate the laser. We scan this optical profilometer around to the crack to determine the profile of the, uh, the crack and then determine the width. Uh, here we can see the, the design. Uh, the system has a size of 12 for uh, 7 square centimeter. Uh, the resolution of the system is 0.1 millimeter in the depth and also in the uh, lateral uh, resolution. This is uh, done by having a laser spot diameter less than 0.1 millimeter. Uh, we started from a commercial range meter where we have uh, modified the firmware and also the optic. Uh, to reach the resolution needed in the project. Here we can see the integration on the module. The module is uh, the green uh, module on the right pixel integrated in the end of factor where there is also an optical camera to uh, precisely uh, collocate the module on the crack. We have successfully uh, measured the crack in the lab uh, less than 0 0.6 millimeter. Um, here we can see um, the communication in the resist architecture. So this module uh, uh, communicates with the crowd control station by using a USB bridge and after uh, transmit the data to the SSE platform. Um, by exploiting a labio user application, uh, the user can set all the measurement parameters that are for the optical profilometer, the modulation frequency, uh, the optical power, the, the gain of the receiver, uh, the algorithm uh, configuration, the Godzilla algorithm configuration, and also set the translation stage parameter like the travel range and the spatial resolution. As the output, we have the surface profile, uh, the, the width itself. Here we can see the user application that we have mainly two panels. Uh, the first one is here represented where the user set the measurement point, the resolution for the translation stage and the step, and they visualize the result. This is the profile of the concrete. Um, here we can see the result of a measurement performed by using the drone uh, with a really large crack of several millimeter. And uh, in this other panel, we can set all the mass, the user can set all the measurement parameter for uh, the laser itself. So for the indirect phase measurement, uh, starting from the top, we have here the gain of the receiver, the power, um, of the laser use, the modulation frequency, um, the sampling frequency for the analog to digital converter, the parameter for the Gosell algorithm. And we have the possibility to uh, 
uh, enable and disable the, uh, the laser and start the measurement. We can move now to the third and final module. This is the vibration sensor module. In the system that it was in the project that it was the necessity to design a vibration module that was really light, uh, low power to communicate with the ground control station. This vibration module is, is uh, glued on the structure by the inspector. After a short integration of the performance of the vibration sensors and the integration, we will see in detail the integration and the user application with the input and the output. And for the vibration model, we decided to use a transceiver from Texas Instrument with a Cortex M3 integrated in the same chip. So we have the microcontroller and the transmission on the same chip to reduce as much as possible the consumption. And for the triaxial measurement, acceleration measurement, we use this accelerometer from analog device. It's a triaxial accelerometer will a uh, really good uh, signal to noise ratio and also uh, analog to digital conversion of the signal. So um, there is also the possibility to set the um, range, uh, the dynamic range, acceleration range. Uh, we have also 20 bit for the analog to digital converter and the noise density is really good. Uh, this accelerometer has a noise density of only 20 microg for square hertz. So the bandwidth is uh, one kilohertz. For the communication, we finally decided to use sub gigahertz communication to improve uh, as much as possible uh, the battery life. Uh, and we use 868 megahertz for communication. Here we can see the vibration module prototype on the right. This is a module with a diameter of 50 uh, millimeter and an height of 30. The, it's really light. The weight is uh, less than 40 grams. We have like a, a small uh, network constituted from uh, uh, several uh, transmitters that simultaneously um, communicates with the receiver on the ground control station. And uh, we have successfully tested the, the communication uh, up to 100 meters. And uh, we have a battery life uh, larger than 72 hours with the continuous uh, communication, but obviously with the intermittent communication, we can have a battery life longer than months. Also here it depends on the frequency of the measurement. Here we can see the integration of the module on the defector and also, and also uh, the, the module that on the right was glued on the wall in the Mesovo bridge. Uh, after the attaching of the module, the module is attached on the wall by using the UV uh, curable glue. The module starts to communicate with the ground control station. Um, in this case, the module can also transmit directly the data to the STC platform, but also we can have a real-time acquisition of the data by exploiting a user application. Uh, in, on the ground control station. The user also in this case, uh, as a control of many parameters, can set the sampling frequency, can decide the acceleration range between uh, um, plus uh, last uh, 248G, decide the transmission power, the optical transmission power, uh, decide also the cutoff frequency for low pass and high pass filter, the bandwidth for the transmission. And as the result of the measurement, we have the three axial acceleration data. Uh, we can also calculate the spectra, so uh, visualizing the vibration mode of the structure, uh, the temperature of the module, and uh, the voltage of the battery. So to have a monitor of the consumption of the battery power. Uh, here we can see this uh, user application where we can have the real-time acquisition of the data. And on the live, uh, the user can control the battery voltage. We can also have an information of the position of the module on the wall, decide the transmission power, the receiver power, and set, as I was saying before, the acceleration range and so on. 
And finally, in this other uh, module, uh, by uh, realizing a fast Fourier transformer of the data, we can also visualize uh, the vibration mode of the structure. Here we can see the fast Fourier transformer along the three axes. And that's it uh, on my side. Thank you, Luca. Uh, we are late, but I think we should take a few minutes for questions. So, Vole, you take the control. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you to, um, to the speakers for the excellent presentations. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, um, but perhaps um, you'd like to to pose your pre your questions now. We still have some time to to do that. So please, if anyone would like to give, uh, I'm gonna ask a question or maybe uh, provide um, some comments. Uh, you're invited to to do that. So just wait for another few seconds, otherwise we. We go for make the... a, a short comment from uh, my side. This uh, first part of presentations uh, was about the, um, let's say, the, the training on the components that uh, work on the field to collect the data, to, to make all the initial, let's say, assessment of collected data. Uh, while uh, the second part, uh, after the coffee break, we'll have the presentation and training on uh, components that are, let's say, uh, the back end of a resist system and how all this data is processed and uh, how the operators can react based on the information collected from the field. So I don't know if you have any question, please don't be shy. Uh, you can make uh, directly your question uh, right now or you can uh, write in the chat uh, section. Um, otherwise you can uh, go on to, oh, okay, I see. I see one question. It's about the drone. So I think that uh, either our partner from Catec and the Seville may answer, either Jose or Guillermo. Uh, it's about the duration of the, of the battery, how long uh, can it last and uh, how long the drone can fly. So um, Jose, do you want to start? Uh, yes, uh, more or less uh, 20 minutes. Twenty minutes. Yes. Okay. Do you for, have any other feedback? For the for the the, the contact drone so for the, the the largest one, the contact drone for, for the tunnel inspection, the battery time is less, uh, something about uh, eight ten minutes. So, but uh, it uh, it has to be to be refined. Um, but uh, yeah, so the battery is is uh, one of the critical critical parts of the uh, I would say the more critical part of the of the drones, and uh, we also have a, a compromise between payload and, and battery. <laughs> and also to add that uh, the the resist let's say drones are. Um, are dedicated to a specific flight plan that is uh, defined before the, the flight. So they do not fly anywhere in the infrastructure. They are, they are sent to inspect a specific area, a specific uh, part of the infrastructure. So based on the flight plan, uh, maybe this time uh, may be sufficient or it, it depends It depends on the inspection uh, process that is uh, underway. So um, any other comment, any other question? Nope. Okay. So, well, I think uh, we should continue. We should go to the coffee break and then come back. Yes, indeed. Um, Thank you, Carlos. Yeah. Thank you for your feedback. I, I suggest we still stick to the 15 minutes um, plan for the coffee break. Um, so, it's 11.35 now. Um, so, we should be back at 11.50 if that's okay with everybody. It's okay. So we, we're back at 11.50 with the inspection mission management module presentation. 
by Eurodynamics. Thank you okay, very much. So, so we wait everyone in the second part. <laughs> we hope not to lose some participants. I think uh, the second part is uh, uh, as interesting as the first one. So yes, yeah, see you in 15 minutes. Thank you. Don't log off, please just stay. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Anastasia, over to you. Okay. Maybe we can start again. The first uh, presentation is uh, about the inspection mission management uh, module. I, I will present this. Uh, let me share the screen. Okay, so let's start uh, with the learning objectives. Uh, the presentation is focusing on this uh, process uh, that uh, we have put together for the inspection mission planning. Uh, we have two uh, kinds of inspection, the quick inspection that uh, um, orchestrates the process for a very rapid uh, capt data capturing of the of a targeted area in order to identify any specific area of interest that needs special attention. And then there is the detailed mission that uh, goes to with a specific equipment uh, on their pass, let's say the full sensor uh, suite, to gather information uh, about this more detailed uh, area that uh, needs to be analyzed further. Um, this is uh, the position of the, uh, of the tool. It is basically uh, more, uh, sitting on the, uh, on the integration environment, but on the user interface uh, side. Uh, like we said, this is, uh, the module is based on a workflow system. Uh, that uh, is able to orchestrate uh, humans, but also machines and other entities uh, by integrating them and then all allocating them uh, tasks. In this uh, case, the inspection process is uh, managing the collaboration of the control center personnel and the field uh, operations. It, uh, facilitates the communication of the operators uh, who have uh, the overview of the situation of the infrastructure in the control room and those on the field uh, which have to uh, plan and manage the, the drones and the data capturing and anal anal analysis of this data. This uh, way, the inspection process uh, is, is somehow systematized uh, with uh, specific steps and formalized uh, so that all the uh, collaborators need to are, um, uh, uh, are involved in a standard process. Uh, here uh, we have a very detailed uh, process that uh, has been defined, but I will go through this uh, very rapidly to, to tell you what is uh, happening. So there is uh, the control operator uh, of an infrastructure owners, uh, owner, uh, which uh, wants uh, to, who has identified uh, with the previous assessments, an area that he wants to uh, monitor, uh, to gather data and, uh, and see if there is any special need uh, for, for an further analysis. So he needs to send, uh, to organize a, a drone mission uh, to send to the specific area. And uh, with this application, he has uh, the ability to initiate this mission and to set the parameters uh, for where he wants to go and what he wants to measure and allocate this to uh, the drone operator. 
the drone operator is notified about this mission request and he has to prepare a mission a flight plan and uh, how this uh, will be executed and uh, how, where the data is stored and uh, this uh, is uh, confirmed uh, by the initiator of the mission there is uh, also the involvement uh, like we said the software entities the photogrammetric and vision system that they uh, have to be informed that the uh, data is available when the drone call gets them in order to analyze and um, send uh, back uh, an information when everything is ready to the operator the, who has a, a new tool, uh, the Quick Image Validator, which is basically a parser, let's see, of the images that uh, help them to identify any preliminary visual check that is necessary further in order to organize um, uh, the, the further analysis. This uh, data that is uh, captured, again, is uh, managed by this process and is uh, sent to the Structural Vulnerability and Risk Assessment Operator, uh, which also is notified that uh, he has work to do in order to present uh, information, uh, his results. And uh, for the quick inspection, uh, this is uh, again the same procedure, but this is uh, done in very, uh, with a very specific drone, that the first one that we have seen with the a stereoscopic camera that uh, goes to gather the initial information before uh, the detailed inspection is uh, uh, operated. Um, here I have uh, put together some screens to, um, to show how this uh, works in practice. So there is a, a quick inspection task, let's say, that uh, is uh, initiated. Uh, then uh, this is uh, visible from the task uh, list, uh, list uh, of the operators. The control operator has a specific form to fill, uh, to, to fill in uh, regarding the mission that he is requesting, to describe the asset, to, to choose uh, which uh, operator should uh, uh, do this uh, assessment, and um, Yes, choose uh, who will be allocated the task. Then the, the uh, task uh, is uh, moving on to the flight uh, plan uh, uh, operator who, who creates this flight plan and uh, has to be confirmed. The control operator, in addition to uh, initiating the task, he has a full overview of the mission of the whole uh, process that is taking place uh, in this uh, kind of screen, which is actually live and uh, monitors in real time uh, who has uh, the task, uh, the next task. The, the, the task uh, that is allocated to the pass operator is visible in his uh, part of the screen. Let's see, he, he gets also informed by an email that uh, he has to do uh, some tasks. He has to prepare the flight plan and uh, he has to allocate uh, the task to, to store a data capture to the specific components uh, that uh, are capturing the information. Then uh, when this is done, the step, uh, next step is uh, the, the allocation of the tasks uh, to the vulnerability assessment to process uh, the information that is captured and the location of this information and then uh, the mission uh, when is the, the mis when the mission is complete the infrastructure owner is again informed about this the the input and output data of this component is uh, the the control operator puts uh, like we said this uh, mission details the flight details uh, about the area he wants to inspect. The process is started and all the uh, entities and the uh, uh, operators are informed in order to take uh, their part in this. The um, inspection project in, uh, process involves, uh, like uh, you have seen, two UIs, the one that is uh, 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 monitoring the entire process and allocates task to its user. So its user uh, accesses this uh, with his own credentials and he has his specific roles. Uh, and uh, the UI 
that is uh, supporting the process uh, that uh, provides a visualization of all the images captured. So we call it a quick image validation tool that allows to select uh, the, the inspection ID. So which uh, kind of mission data you somebody wants to see and uh, select uh, specific images that uh, he wants to check in order to take decisions uh, for further actions. So the various users uh, of the inspection planning system uh, with this uh, pro workflow process uh, have a standard procedure and a very clear role. So where to, when to, to, to get involved uh, in this process. Thank you. So the next uh, presentation is uh, from pa our partner Isa and the presenting the uh, structural vulnerability assessment and risk management module. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, <laughs> we made a small adaptation to the plan. So it's going to be a joint presentation with uh, from Risa and DBA. So DBA will start with um, two modules that we have selected to present in this uh, workshop. And then uh, we take over to show you a live demonstration of the Saxon Vulnerability Assessment Tool and how the user can uh, work with it. So Apostoli, if you can start. Uh, hello, I'm Apostolos from DBA. Uh, can I share my screen now with you? Um, Yes, you can, or, okay. Uh, you see my screen now? Yes. yes. Uh, okay. Um, uh, first of all, uh, we have a tool uh, for landslides. Uh, as a, a failure of a slope is considered the state uh, where uh, the resultant of the tangential to a surface shear stresses exceeds the corresponding shear strength resultant. And uh, this, is, um, this is the case that we have a generalized uh, shear slip uh, of the slope. Excess shear stress resultant is expected to be developed for the following actions corresponding to the normal conditions or the accidental destructive events. Uh, th those are the cases that are studied. Self-weight of the soil or of the rock mass, the increased groundwater uh, level after an extreme weather condition, additional earthquake actions, additional blasting actions due to explosion. Now, the investigation of the slope stability covers the following topics. The estimation of the safety factor equal to the ratio between the active strength to the active stress shear resultant. The estimation of a critical horizontal acceleration, which corresponds to the beginning of the sliding failure. And finally, the estimation of a risk level after a destructive event, depending on the ratio of the sliding displacement due to the event with respect to the maximum possible sliding displacement of the ground formation. To have all this calculated, we need some data. The data required for the risk estimation are the geometry of the cross section of the slope, the ground profile and the geotechnical parameters of the soil layers and the rock formation, the horizontal and vertical accelerations imposed from earthquake or in case we have an explosive material in explosion, the maximum groundwater level. In the tool, uh, the failure modes that are uh, calculated are two the rotational and the planar case. Uh, here we, in the upper image, we see the rotational failure. In slopes of uh, soil material, the failure consists to the rotation of the failed soil mass around the horizontal axis 
on a cylindrical sliding surface. In this case, we see the calculation of the safety factor with some uh, coefficients a1, a2, a3, and uh, the uh, water pore pressure co coefficient ru. And uh, the second case of the planar uh, failure, the failed mass is moving on the plane sliding surface over a primary joint of the bedrock, which in the most adverse case passed through the foot of the slope. In this case, uh, we see that uh, the safety factor is calculated from this uh, relationship. Now, regarding the tool, uh, the investigated geometrical space is imported as a file, as a DXF or DWG drawing file into the tool from here. And uh, automatically, the global coordinates that, gen that, that generate the geometry are stored into the system. After this, the number of the soils of the soil layers and the thicknesses of the soil layers are assigned to the geometry from uh, the defined tab here, while the soil parameters are uh, given uh, to the uh, layers, uh, are selected uh, from a, a pre-stored uh, material library, or uh, there is the, the uh, capability to define a new material that does not exist to the library. All the assignments are shown here, all the assignments on the layers. As the next step, you have the ability from here to choose whether you have an, a water table or a no water table in the problem that you want to study. As the next step, you have the ability to select um, uh, the, the case that you want to study. You, you, you can choose to work for normal operating conditions. Here, the safety factor uh, is estimated against the shear failure due to self-weight of the soil or the rock mass and the possible permanent groundwater level implying its movement along the sliding surface. If, if you choose to have an increased groundwater level, uh, the, temp the temporary increment of the groundwater level due to the downpour rains occurring in a short time period of extreme weather condition is estimated according to this exp expression, uh, where the height of the rain is defined here, the filtration coefficient, and the porosity of the ground to be calculated here and uh, to be calculated with the in this, the permanent ground water level. Another case, uh, it is the uh, ground accelerations. Ground accelerations defined uh, from earthquakes or uh, defined from explosive materials. Uh, forces uh, addition, additional to the gravity are applied here, uh, which are due to accelerations developed, uh, developed during ground oscillations which are induced from earthquakes or explosions. The maximum acceleration there as a vector sum of a horizontal and a vertical component, uh, which are uh, represented, those are the components, AX and AY, uh, which are represented here and uh, uh, take account into the calculations. Now, the explosions, uh, which are uh, high, freq high frequency and uh, short duration oscillations uh, are taken account as uh, a peak point velocity. Uh, the peak point velocity that we see here takes account the weight of the explosive charge written as Q, the distance from the blast center. And we choose here a material, if, if the material is very loose or rocky, and uh, it, it, the, the system automatic, automatically assigns a frequency. Uh, and the next step is the risk grading. 
Uh, the state of a slope after an earthquake of an explosion, which is defined by acceleration coefficient, implying a safety factor ma uh, uh, lower than one, is characterized as of low, medium, or high risk. The risk raised grading is based on the ratio of the relative displacement of the failed ground wedge on the sliding surface with respect to the maximum possible relative displacement. Uh, this is the case that we uh, make this calculation in terms of displacement control. Here we see uh, the, uh, uh, the intervals uh, at which the, the tool calculates the risk. So between this, in this interval, the risk is low. If it is in this interval, the risk can be characterized as medium risk. And if it is in this interval, the, the risk is high. Another very critical tool uh, above the whole process is the tool for strength, strengthening decisions. Um, the risk analysis aims at the estimation of the following critical parameters which affect the treatment and the use of a part of the transport infrastructure, bridge or tunnel, after a destructive event. First of all, the damage degree of each one damage or failed structural member, which constitutes a part of the necessary data for the estimation of the cost and the time required for its repair and strengthening. And second, the functionality of the infrastructure which is defined by the magnitude of the permissible traffic loads, the part of the structure available for the application, and the capacity of the structure for resist to subsequent events, for example, earthquake aftershocks, which will probably occur during the time period of the repair and strengthening. The process here uh, is based on the tool which calculates, uh, let's see first for uh, reinforced concrete structural members, the damage degree uh, is calculated at a critical cross-section of the structural member, which is equals uh, to the universe of the safety factor F. The safety factor is defined as the ratio between the ultimate bending moment and the bending moment developed under operating conditions. The damage degree is classified to the following five damage categories, which are distinguished from the relation of the moment MA with respect to the characteristic bending moments of the cross sections. In other words, the tool calculates all the critical points on the moment, the, the bending moment curvature diagram, and then with the damage degree calculated, the damage degree is, uh, is uh, specified where, where it belongs, at which interval of the, uh, between the critical points of the, uh, of the diagram, the bending moment curvature diagram. And with this classification, from, from where the damage degree belongs, we decide how critical is the state uh, and which are the strengthening decisions that have to be made. Uh, DC1 is no risk case when the damage degree is in this close interval, where MRI is the bending moment corresponding to the bending of the crack formation, we say that we have no risk. DC2 is acceptable risk, damage degree now is in this interval, where MRF is the bending moment corresponding to the formation of the permissible crack width. Uh, the, the, the previous bending moment was before the formation, and this is uh, uh, corresponding to the formation of the uh, permissible width. Uh, in the meantime, we have some elastic rotations of the section. At DC3, we have low risk. MY1 is the bending moment corresponding to the first yielding material if it is steel or if it is concrete. DC4 is, uh, is the case uh, when the damage degree falls in this interval, 
where my2 is the bending moment corresponding to the first yielding of the second material subjected previously elastic behavior, while the previously yielded material executes a plastic rotational behavior, both implying the state of the plastic hinge formation. And the final case is the, the DC5, where we have high risk, where the damage degree is bigger than the ratio uh, between the uh, first uh, yielding moment of the second material uh, and the ultimate uh, bending moment. And this case cor is corresponding to the full plastic hinge behavior. Uh, and we have the total collapsed case. Here we see uh, the moment curvature diagram calculated for the beam of the TAF9 uh, uh, bridge uh, at Peristeri. We see the characteristics, uh, the, the first yielding moment, the second yielding moment, the ultimate limit uh, moment um, uh, uh, as it is calculated by the tool. Uh, the next case is for a, a steel uh, structural uh, members. Uh, the following three damage categories are, they are considered into the um, uh, tool. The damage uh, category one is no risk. Uh, here we have uh, the case that corresponds to the condition where uh, the uh, maximum stress um, uh, occurred is lower than the 0.65 of the yielding stress of the material um, of the steel without local or global flexural or torsional uh, buckling uh, uh, cases. Uh, the second uh, category is medium risk, uh, which corresponds at least to one of the following conditions. The max occurred stress uh, is in the interval between the 0.65 yielding stress of the uh, steel, uh, elastic local or global flexural or toscanal buckling, elastic deformations of the steel plates or partial cracking of the weldings at the connections are cases to be seen here. And uh, uh, the, the last category, corresponds at least to one of the following conditions where the maximum occurred uh, uh, steel stress uh, is, in the, is larger than the uh, steel, the yielding, uh, uh, the yielding stress and um, uh, lower than the ultimate uh, steel stress. Uh, we have here plastic total or global flexural or torsional buckling. We have plastic deformations of the steel plates, breaking of screws, extensive cracking of the weldings at the connections. And uh, with these uh, uh, three categories, the analysis for strengthening options of steel members uh, is uh, uh, completed by the tool. cases in the full in the integrated tool uh, represented uh, by Stefanos. Um, can you hear me? Stefanos? Yes, Aposoli. If you can stop sharing uh, your stop screen. Sharing. Yes, yeah, I can stop. So that... Is it okay? Yes. Okay, so my plan for today is to give you a small insight on how the tool that uh, was an outcome of World Package 3 and World Package 7 is working and what actually the user at the end from the infrastructure will see, which we are going to be probably also a user that is not very experienced or have not all the knowledge of all this equation and all how all the stuff behind uh, is working. So I'm going to, there are two ways to log in or directly to our 
to our tools through the disease platform provided by European Dynamics. So I use their uh, authentication service. So I log in. Oops. So this is the entrance screen for where I have, I can manage my infrastructure. I have the ability to manage more than one infrastructure. This infrastructure are divided into categories, bridges and tunnels. I will start for this presentation with the tunnel. In this demo, we have two tunnels, the <coughs> Patrolia uh, tunnel that was also part of our second pilot where I can see here how we can describe this tunnel. First, we define tunnel section. Most of the times the tunnels are divided into three, four, five sections that share the same characteristic geometry. So, so here, sorry, I don't know what's happened, but here we can see that we have first tunnel section that's from starting from zero till 50 meters here we are describing all the data for this uh, section i don't know what's happened and Someone tries to log in and throw me away, but okay. And we are here we have each tunnel section is described by 16, uh, by 36 uh, nodes. Each node has the XY um, position of the, of the node. And then we have the cross, So I don't know what is happening, but we have three cross section here defined where we can see the analysis of the structural assessment module where we see we have here a bad location on node six and a bad location on node 27. And here are Sorry. The calculation results. Um, we have the external pressure, the axial force, the shear force, and the bending moment. Um, again, here are the 36 um, bits that the tunnel is, the cross section is divided. Sorry for that, but something happened and the system locks me, locks me out and locks in again. We have also the possibility to see the tunnel in a 3D, 3D model. So here the user can navigate. These are again, these buttons that we see are the 36 uh, nodes from each cross section and they are colored according to the damage Sorry for that. They are colored according to the damage index of the node, or we can see the cracks or the defects on it. Now I've selected the mode to show me the defects or the cracks. So I see that on this node here on the top, I think this is node 16, I have a crack. I can select that and I see here the information for this crack. I see it's happened in the Petrolia tunnel on cross section from meter 10 to 20. It's on cross section node 16. It doesn't have a structural impact. We have inspected this crack two times, one on June 19 and one on May 20. And I see here the evolution. This is a tool that allows me to see the evolution Oh, I don't believe that now. 
sorry again. I can go also here to select my cross section and I see here the cracks. And I can see also the pictures that are um, captured due from the from the computer vision uh, team that identify the cracks. And also we have the sorry again the laser scan where it's the team from the University of Seville, they go through the tunnel and they inspect the cross section and we and then DBA calculates the cords in order to identify the deformation. This is happening via this panel here. We select the idea of the, all this information come, comes automatically from the thesis platform. We have here TXT file that are the measurements from the laser scanner. This laser scan, this file is evaluated by DBA and generates these cords. And these cords are the, the distances from, for, the, for the cross section. And through this um, cord, the structural assessment tool calculates the damage index for the whole cross section and for the, and every node uh, separately. So I will stop here because something happens and the system restarts all the time. I don't know why this. I don't know if you have any questions. Otherwise, I will pass the floor to ICS for the mobility continuity tool. Thanks, Bedmanus. Uh, I will take over and uh, we can continue yeah. with the questions uh, after my presentation uh, as well. So um, let me share my screen. Um, okay. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So I will present the mobility continuity module and the mobile application that has been developed. Um, the objectives of this uh, training uh, session is to provide an overview of the module and present the subcomponents and the architecture of the tool um, to identify the users and their main uh, interactions among them and with the system. Uh, to analyze the module that is dedicated to the driver behavior and uh, to describe the key functionalities of the tool and present the, the user interface. So let's start with a, a brief description. Uh, the mobility continuity module, it's a, actually a set of uh, ICT tools with three main uh, objectives. Um, to support the trip planning um, and uh, adaptation based on the availability of uh, transport network and uh, routes. To address incidents uh, or uh, typical, let's say, maintenance uh, activities that may affect uh, the availability of uh, a route or of a lane uh, and so on. And to inform all stakeholders, commuters, operators, and uh, stakeholders uh, in the vicinity of uh, an event about uh, the existence of such events that may affect their uh, trip and also to provide alternative routes and uh, options, uh, transportation options, and ensure the seamless uh, mobility. So the subcomponents of uh, the tool are split in two uh, parts, the back end and the front end uh, components. So in the back end, we have the, the trip planner, the mobility simulator, uh, the road and lane event management tool, uh, the identity and access management, the persistence of user data and road events tool, and the API. While in the front end, we have two main uh, applications, let's say, the operator dashboard, that's dedicated obviously to the road operators uh, in order to monitor and manage uh, um, the road uh, network and the mobile application that has been developed and uh, can be used by every user and commuter of uh, the road. Um, so here's the position of uh, the mobility continuity module in the whole resist architecture is in the application, uh, let's say, layer, as you can see. Um, and it has been also integrated with the platform, so um, the operator can uh, directly see uh, 
uh, actually, let's see, um, operate the system through the integration platform. And uh, okay, here is the, the data that uh, the tool uh, uses as input and as uh, output. So we have uh, the road network. Uh, we have used uh, an, an OpenStreetMaps uh, format uh, for the networks uh, that uh, we tested. Um, some open source decoding services in order to, to get the information about the street name and position. Um, information about public transit and available routes, schedules, and so on, bus lanes, and so on. And uh, then we have the input information that are collected by uh, the users. So we have the information about the traffic. Uh, so the road operator through the dashboard can uh, import information about uh, current dynamically uh, dynamic information about traffic, uh, road capacity, vehicle composition, and so on. And uh, we have the information uh, from uh, the user uh, perspective. So information about the user profile uh, that's retrieved through the questionnaires uh, that are uh, available in the mobile application. I will say more in a while for this. And also about the position of uh, each user, the dynamic position of each user through the localization interface of uh, the mobile uh, phone. Um, as an output, uh, the application, the module uh, provides uh, a trip itinerary based on the origin and destination uh, uh, locations and the available uh, routes. And uh, also um, some custom notifications about uh, road and lane uh, closures. Um, it also suggests some route uh, alternatives if, in case of uh, unavailability of uh, a route. And um, for the road operator uh, perspective, uh, it also calculates uh, the speed, uh, the average speed uh, per lane. So um, let's say some uh, details about the uh, driver behavior analysis. Uh, this is a very important tool that has been integrated uh, in the mobile application that has been uh, developed. This is a tool that, uh, in order to assess uh, how the user, uh, the highway user behave under emergency and under stress conditions. So uh, it takes into account both psychological and behavioral dimensions of safety and uh, risk. And um, this is, uh, is fed through some questionnaires, through a questionnaire that's provided by the mobile application and uh, collects data regarding social demographics, uh, driving uh, characteristics and exposure, um, the tendency of the user to take risks and how it uh, reacts and cope with uh, extreme events, and also um, the preferable uh, communication ways in uh, case of an extreme event, and uh, uh, also um, a permission uh, to show pop-up notifications about such events. So based on the, on the feedback from uh, the user, from the questionnaire, uh, all these factors are, are analyzed and uh, clustered. So um, there have been defined three um, uh, support levels uh, based on user personas, based on their needs and requirements and so on. These support levels uh, are the need support, the would like support and cool. So based on the feedback from the questionnaire, each user is allocated to a cluster, to one of these support levels. And uh, based on this cluster, it gets customized the uh, road and lane event uh, messaging in the application. Uh, just to clarify the customization, it's not regarding the context of the messaging, but it's about the frequency, for example, and the cases where such messages will appear, for example, if I need, uh, if I'm in the group that needs support, uh, I will get uh, as many notifications as possible so as to handle each uh, incident, um, even a small one, a, a not very important one. But in the cool, let's say, uh, cluster, the frequency will be um, uh, will be less. So um, the main users uh, are the road operators and the road users. So the functionalities provided for the road operators is mainly uh, the visualization of road and lane status, the ability to manage uh, this uh, status of road and lane and open and close lanes and uh, the whole road, for example, in case of an incident or of uh, a typical, let's say, maintenance uh, process, 
And uh, also the tool uh, calculates the, the speed in, in real time for its, uh, for its lane. So the operator can be aware about the condition of, uh, of the traffic, the traffic flow. Um, on the other hand, for the road users, the, the commuters, um, the module uh, supports trip planning and uh, navigation and uh, enhance the awareness about uh, events and uh, hazards and also provide some uh, rerouting suggestions uh, and alternatives in case of um, unavailability of some, uh, some routes. So let's move on to the user interface of the component. Uh, I will start with the road operator dashboard. Here you can see the, the dashboard uh, the screen uh, as the operator can, uh, can see it. So uh, in this case, uh, it's for the, for the Gnatia motorway uh, network. So um, through this dashboard, the operator can manage uh, the road and lane uh, status and monitor uh, their condition, um, visualize uh, alternative routes in case of uh, closure, uh, update road capacity and vehicle composition, and uh, monitor the, the real-time uh, calculation of uh, average speed. So um, as you can see here, you have the ability to open uh, our, I think it's a quite a small one, but uh, let me uh, provide you the key, uh, let's say, points. Uh, you can open and close uh, the whole uh, road, the whole part of the road, or you can select a specific direction, specific lane to, to be closed. And uh, when this happens, this uh, lane or this part of the road is uh, becoming unavailable and uh, um, a relevant notification uh, is received by the mobile applications, but the, by the users that are affected by this uh, change. Um, you can also ad adjust the, the traffic uh, per hour uh, based on the information the operator already has by the backend systems of the motorway control center. And also the composition of uh, vehicles. So if you have many heavy vehicles, this uh, will affect the whole traffic flow and so on. And based on all this information, the system calculates dynamically the, the average um, speed per lane. And uh, this information is also received by the users so as to know that maybe the route is partially available, but the, for example, the, the speed uh, has been lowered. Um, here is the mobile application uh, for the commuters. It's an Android application that's available uh, in Google Play and providing a user-friendly environment. It can be downloaded by everyone. Uh, currently, it covers uh, the resist pilot area, so the Gnatia motorway in Greece and the A32 motorway uh, in Italy. Um, its potential users are all drivers currently using Resist Network, but this can be adapted to whichever net road network um, and provide uh, the same functionalities. Uh, so um, through this application, uh, the user can have uh, customized trip planning and notifications about the uh, road and uh, lane events. Uh, here are some screenshots from this application. Uh, so here you can see the registration uh, and the login uh, uh, screen. Uh, you can uh, register with uh, your email and name and so on. You don't need any credentials provided by anyone. You just create an account and you just sign in. And uh, the first time uh, you sign in, um, the questionnaire uh, is the first uh, thing you will see, and it's obligatory to be filled in. So, you, so as you you create a user profile and be allocated to a user um, a clustering based on which you will get the notifications and uh, so on about uh, events and hazards. Uh, after the completion of the questionnaire. Um, uh, the application requires you requires the user to activate uh, the localization interface, the GPS, and so on. So uh, the user is uh, localized. Here you can see an example where uh, um, the user is somewhere close to Igumenica in northern Greece. And uh, the user can search for a, whichever destination, uh, apparently for the, for the resist uh, network that is currently available. So here we have uh, selected as a destination uh, Thessaloniki. And uh, based on this origin and the uh, destination, the application provides the, the, available, uh, the best available uh, route. 
here you can see the root. And uh, if you select these three three lines here, you can see the exact information about the, the exact directions you need uh, to follow, based on which you will be navigating. So, um, in case of an event, uh, this is um, the, the the operator will uh, will manually, let's say. Uh, change the status of the lane or of the road or of a specific part of uh, the network. And uh, based on this, some, uh, some routes may become unavailable. So in this case, the user that uh, will need to use this route uh, gets an information, gets an alert about uh, this event. Here you can see um, the, here you can see the pop-up uh, about uh, the information. In this case, we have some roadworks in uh, a tunnel uh, in Ignatia. And uh, you can see the localization also of the, of the alert. So in the, in the whole route you saw, we saw before, here you can see where exactly this event uh, has happened. And uh, the application suggests uh, rerouting and provides an alternative route. Here, if you can see, this is, uh, it's not a close up, but if you can see, it's not the main uh, network of Agnatia Road, uh, which is the yellow one, but it's uh, another route following a um, side network in order to avoid this tunnel and obviously the, the, the event that has, make, uh, has made the, this uh, route uh, unavailable. Um, the application also provides some uh, uh, pages, let's say, some screens about uh, the details of uh, the user, the profile. So you can uh, change your name or something. You can uh, change your email. And also some information about the Resist, Resist project. Uh, that's the main funding, let's say, uh, the, from the European uh, Union, the funding uh, scene. And uh, it can also allow the user to, to log out from the, from the application. So uh, just to summarize uh, all the above, um, the mobility continuity module um, provides uh, real-time management and control of road and lane status uh, and events for the road uh, operator. Uh, it uh, supports trip planning and navigation for the users and also provides uh, information in real time about events and uh, alternative uh, uh, routes. Um, the frequency of uh, the provision of alerts it can be customized based on the dri driver uh, uh, condition uh, uh, and preferences and based on their uh, behavior under stress. Um, so uh, through this application, through this module, uh, the whole situational awareness is enhanced for both operators and users that can, that can be uh, in real time aware about what is going on in the route and avoid unavailable uh, areas. And uh, also it provides a, a clear and uh, effective communication uh, tool uh, between all stakeholders involved, involved in the transportation uh, process uh, from the transport operators and users uh, up to emergency responders uh, or even public in the, in the vicinity that may be affected by such, uh, uh, such events. So um, this is it from my side. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions either from my presentation or for the previous ones. We have one more presentation, Margarita, for the cybersecurity. Ah, yes, we have the cybersecurity. Yes, you're right. Sorry, I forgot it. So yes, uh, I think Yasmin can can take over, and uh, we can then move on to the to the questions. Sorry for this. Hello, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yeah, it's fine. Perfect. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Yasmin Somarakis. Um, I am security engineer with Sphinx. We are responsible for the cybersecurity application module. So the learning objectives of these presentations are targeted to the role of cybersecurity operator, as this is the only user that will be using this application. Uh, and we will learn, learn, we will give you an overview of the tool and its placement in the resist. And uh, I'm going to show you a few of its core functionalities 
uh, map to specific views of the web application. Specifically, we're going to see the project management view, the assets management view, and the security assessments management view. That includes the initiation flows for assessment and the results, examining the results. So a short description. The cybersecurity assurance framework is responsible for the specification, at first and foremost, the specification and management of the organization's assets. Uh, that's every software or hardware of resist. And this is what we call the asset model. Secondly, it's responsible for the specification, management, and initiation of security assessment assessments. Uh, the framework currently supports uh, three types of assessments, the vulnerabilities assessments, penetration testing assessment, and monitoring assessment. In so in Resist, the framework is used to, to, to perform assessments on the specified assets by the cybersecurity uh, operator, and examining, of course, the results of these assessments. Uh, if we take a look at the placement of the uh, framework in Resist, as you can see, it's right down here. Uh, it basically touches every layer of Resist, starting from uh, uh, components on the field, but also in the backend to have a holistic overview of uh, all the platform. And uh, with regards to input and output, the primary input for the component is the asset model. As I said, to use effectively the module, you have to define the assets that you are going to protect and assess if they are secure enough. Uh, so having defined the assets, the asset model, then you have to define some assessed models and profiles. These are basically parameters for executing the assessments. And the output of the, of the tool is the security assessment results. Uh, these are the findings that have been generated after the execution of the security assessments. So I'm going, guide, I'm going to guide you through the views of the tool. The first thing that uh, the operator sees when they uh, log into the tool is the home view. Uh, out of this view, the most important section is the project section, uh, but you can also see organizations and end user management sections that are out of the scope of this training. So we will focus for, on the project section. As you can see, if I zoom a little bit, uh, we have created uh, one project for each pilot and one for resist. Uh, the, each project contains the assets for its, for its uh, case and the assessments, the respective assessments. So inside the project view, uh, we have four primary sections, the general, the overview, the assets, and the assessments group. In the general section, you can edit, view, or delete the project. In the overview section, you can view various KPIs regarding the assets of the project. For instance, how many assets per asset type do you have? Uh, asset type is like software, hardware, person, etc. And other interesting metrics. In, this, in the assets uh, section, you can see a comprehensive list of all the assets defined under this project. And you also have means to add new assets, delete, and edit. And finally, in the assessment groups section, you can view all the executed security assessments. Uh, and you can, of course, initiate, uh, upload results, and view security assessments. Uh, and I'm going to guide you through each of the sessions separately. So starting off with the asset section. As I said, there is a table in this section indicating all assets of, uh, that have been defined. Uh, you can define an asset either in a single instance via step-by-step -step wizard by starting the, uh, the process with the create asset uh, button. And you have to fill a form like this one indicating uh, on the figure below that includes per uh, asset specific details. For instance, for a software asset, you have to define, for example, the vendor, the version, uh, if it's a service or a 
component uh, for each asset, you have to define different uh, values. We also support a batch mode creation that it, it's done by uh, an Excel file. So you populate the Excel file with every value that if, 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 with every asset, and then you upload it with the upload definitions button right here. So for the most interesting part, the assessments, uh, as I said, we have three types of assessments, the vulnerabilities, the penetration testing and monitoring. To initiate any of these assessments, you have to be in the respective project under the assessment groups section. As you can see in this figure on the top, there is nothing uh, yet. And then we can click the initiate assessment, which then initiates the step-by-step -step wizard that allows you to input different parameters for this specific assessment, and then finally execute it. In short, for this type of assessment, we have to check, to have to input the model type, that's the vulnerabilities assessment. We have to indicate the profile, that's the default profile that have been uh, created uh, by us. And you have to select the assets that you want to assess. Uh, finally, you have to select the model execution. That's when do you want the assessment to be executed. This assessment, for instance, supports two modes upon user request and periodically. In this instance, we are using upon user request. This means the assessment starts immediately. Uh, after the execution of the assessments, you can navigate to, to its results via the assessment groups uh, section that I showed you uh, earlier. In each of these uh, sections, you can see two primary subsections. That's the basic info that contains administrative information about each assessment. And you have the assessment results section that indicates various KPIs about the specific assessment, such as uh, how, many vulnerable, how many vulnerabilities did you find per asset, as you can see on the diagram right here on the right. And in this section, you also have a table with a comprehensive list of the results that's tailored to each specific assessment type. For this example, uh, the vulnerability assessment, you can see on each result uh, technical information such as the common vulnerability enumeration and the, the mapping to the specific vector of this instance for the common vulnerability enumerator. Moving on to the next uh, assessment, uh, similarly to the previous one, you have to navigate to, for, for penetration testing assessment, you have to navigate to uh, assessment group section under the specific project you are in, initiate the process, uh, select the assessment model, select the specific profile for this model, select an asset. In this case, we select uh, one asset, a hardware asset, because this component actually interacts with the actual VM that hosts this uh, application. and uh, performs the tests. We choose here the, assess the model execution and then we can initiate the assessment. Uh, this type of assessment also supports the upload of a raw report. This means that if, for example, someone has OpenVAS installed on their computer and they, and they execute it and then they produce a report with that, they can easily upload it here. Uh, the results for this type of assessment, again, uh, two sections on this view, uh, with the basic info showing, again, administrative information about the assessment, and uh, the assessment results section showing similar KPIs to the previous one, but with a comprehensive list of the results showing a bit more technical information uh, gathered through this process. For instance, uh, uh, this type of assessment can produce um, technical recommendations for the vulnerability, uh, mitigation, uh, mitigation approaches, uh, and other diff and other insight, uh, technical insights. Finally, the monitoring assessment, you can initiate it similarly via the assessment groups uh, section under this project. You have to choose the monitoring assessment model, the specific uh, availability, the specific profile for this uh, case. In this case, so it's availability. 
the asset that you want to monitor. And because monitoring runs continuously, you have to select continuously here and set a period, uh, start and end. Uh, upon using uh, initiate, you can see again uh, a similar um, view on the results with uh, uh, some slight differences. For instance, for on the basic info section, you can see that there is a refresh page uh, button. This button is used to, if, to get always the latest results of monitoring because it runs continuously indefinitely until you end it or until it stops due to the execution profile you previously set. And you see also some different KPIs here uh, relevant to this type of assessment. Uh, finally, the technical uh, list of all the results, uh, again, shows tailored information for this type of assessment. In this case that we are checking the availability of, this, of a service, uh, you can see here that is actually pinging this service to check if it's up or not. Uh, and uh, basically in this uh, presentation, I show you how to, uh, the basic views of this application, how, and uh, through this, how to define an asset and the asset model, and how to initiate assessments and view the results. I see I have a question, ah, no. Okay, this is uh, all actually, thank you. If you have any questions. Thank you for, thank you to all the speakers for this very interesting training. Uh, we are now almost at the end of the, of the workshop. So one last chance, I don't see any questions or comments in the chat. So the last chance to, uh, to, to give some comments or to ask one or two questions before we close. We are actually very, very good with regards to timing. Thank you to the speakers for keeping to the time. Um, uh, okay, in the absence of any questions or comments. Hey, can, I, can I speak to you a little bit to Vole, to everybody, just a small comment? Please do, please. Yes. Yes, it is a, an issue that I would like, I mean, I raised uh, in the beginning and you took it indicating we have to see whom we are to train. The key element, I mean, first of all, the whole presentation was the best. It, it was really very good. All the details were given and we do know at this point how the whole structure will develop. However, we must not forget that this is a project that we should sell it, let's say, to the European Union in order to multiply our knowledge. And the key element here, and I invite, I mean, I will talk, of course, to Wole afterwards because he are both in uh, Brussels here. And I invite all of us to see the task 10.1 in this project that we have, which of course is the basic and already Fecher has already sent it. And we are going to continue now with the 10.6 with all these training results. The key element in this 10.1 point is it will also clarify to whom, to whom the dissemination communication is directed. I mean, to whom we are going to give all this communication and how, how this information will be transmitted. So there are two issues here, but uh, this is what I raised in the beginning. We have to see, for example, we have constructed a very good platform, a very good matrix. This thing did not exist so far in the European Union. And this is what we really achieved. What we need to do now is to work on that and to invite the European Commission to understand that our platform could be the basis of the average theoretical platform that can be used in each state, in each region. And all of us can easily guarantee that 
our results will not be forgotten in the drawer of the European Commission as certain projects happen. So I invite all of us to reflect and to see how all these excellent results should be communicated first to the Commission and then to all the others. We must not forget that here is a market. Everything that we suggest has a cost and it has to be judged by how many lives we save, how much we appear saving the infrastructure, how much we take care of the environment, and of course, how we use our information to save the benefits of our users. So this is in principle. I believe that we'll have the opportunity later to exchange emails, but I suggest to reflect how we are going to give and what information to the others. Thank you, Wole, thank you all. Thank you, Kalistratos. Thank you, as usual, for your comments. Uh, any any feedback on that, on so what Kalistratos said? Uh, I think these are very important um, aspects, definitely. Uh, actually, I will I will take the opportunity based on uh, Kalistratos' uh, comments to, uh, to say that, yes, this is the, the overall goal of Resist, and we need to have, a, let's say, a common uh, strategy on this. Um, so I think it's a really nice opportunity to for our final uh, event that uh, will be conducted in 10 days in uh, 24th of uh, June, uh, where it will be a much more, let's say, interactive uh, event. Uh, uh, and uh, it will include also a discussion about uh, the next steps and how we can uh, take advantage of uh, current uh, achievements. So yes, you can already find the registration link in um, in our social media and uh, in our website and uh, register to uh, to the final event. And then we can further discuss uh, this uh, very interesting uh, topic. So thank you all. Thank all. Uh, let me thank all participants. Thank you, Vola, for the organization of this, and Angelica and, and Anastasia. I don't know if there is any other comment. I don't see anything, so I think we can uh, we can close the meeting. Thank you. Have a nice afternoon. So oh, thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Thank you. <laughs>